Uh, we've been looking at reversible processes a little bit, but I haven't done too much to quantify them, but we're going to do that today. So uh, remember we had this idea of uh, these incremental heat transfers. I guess we use, well, it depends on whether we do a mass basis or a total basis, but most often we do a total. We had this idea of incremental heat transfer and work being done where the uh, reversibility came, especially for the heat transfer, because the actual temperature difference between the source and the system was very, very small. And that allowed us to uh, then uh, uh, treat that as a reversible heat transfer. Um, and then, of course, a reversible work goes with that. Oh, good, I'm glad I've got those now. Uh, class dismissed while well, I go grade papers. So, the book develops for us the next part, and I don't want to go through the whole development of it, but it's the idea that if we integrate around the entire cycle, and that's what that system, uh, that symbol represents for us, if we integrate the quantity of the heat transfer divided by that the temperature of the system at that heat transfer, and remember for the Carnot cycle we were looking at, that was made up of four processes. Two of them were isothermal, so that's the temperature we're talking about for those heat transfer parts. Then the other two parts of the process that weren't isothermal were adiabatic, so they had uh, uh, they didn't have any heat transfer associated with them. So. Um, We integrate around the entire cycle and something the book doesn't do and just is kind of a nice little help I think is just puts that B right there to remind us this is the heat transfer at the boundary. We're not talking about any other heat transfers that might occur within the system. That barely even looks like boundary. That quantity can take on either uh, one of two, two uh, forms. If that quantity, as we integrate around the entire cycle, is zero, then we know that we have a reversible cycle, or no irreversibilities are present. If that is less than zero, then we know that there are irreversibilities present in the system. So that allows us this, uh, this first real chance to uh, actually determine if certain cycles are uh, reversible or not. Now, for the, irre or for the reversible one, this idea that if we go about an entire cycle and integrate this, add all these up for the most part, we don't have to actually do the integration, add all these heat transfers up, divide by the temperature at which they occur, since that is zero for reversible cycle, actually, doesn't have to be for reversible. Just the fact that that if we sum this up for uh, uh, all the way around a cycle and it, there's no change, that means that this quantity del Q over T is itself a thermodynamic property. Because that's 
what's happened with all our other thermodynamic properties. Internal energy, uh, enthalpy, even specific volume. If we went all the way around the cycle, came back to where we started, uh, then there was no total change in those quantities, then they were thermodynamic uh, properties, and we could use them as such. So we define then our last thermodynamic property, known as entropy. And uh, that's, that's to represent my capital S. Remember, if a letter is large, it means it's on a total basis. If it's small, it's an intensive property or a, a uh, per mass basis. And so we define entropy as this, as this, uh, this new quantity that we can then use now to quantify how reversible uh, processes and the cycles are. Okay, so if we do that along a path rather than around a whole cycle, then we can treat it just like any other thermodynamic property that we might be looking at. Its units Units on heat transfer, kilojoules per degree Kelvin or BTUs per degree Rankine. That's on the, the total basis, on the per mass basis, kilojoules per kilogram degree K. Um, which gets about as many of my favorite letter K in there as possible. Or BTU per pound mass degree ranking. And that temperature must be in, uh, in absolute units. And again, just emphasizing the fact that it's a, a thermodynamic, is indeed a true thermodynamic property. Um, and we can use it that way, uh, means that the entropy is a point function. Remember that's different from a path function like work is, where work depends upon the path. The change in, in heat, in, change in entropy doesn't. So as we can start to use that, then for uh, reversible processes, then we can calculate this change in entropy from the property tables themselves and Use that to find the, the work. I'm uh, sorry, the heat transfer. And emphasize that that's, a, that's for reversible processes. For irreversible processes, then then if we calculate or use the property tables to find this delta S we're going to find that it's greater 
than would have happened from the uh, looking at the heat transfer alone. So we can actually use that fact uh, to determine if processes are irreversible. We can calculate the heat transfer divided by the temperature at which that occurred, compare that to the change in entropy from the property tables, and it'll tell us whether or not we have a reversible process. Since those aren't equal for real processes, there's a slightly different way we could look at the very same thing. And say that uh, the entropy change for a system is going to be made up of heat transfer. Remember that's that's uh, that's the the reversible part as we look at it, the part right at the boundary. But since they're not equal, then there's got to be a greater part that we can call the entropy generation that entropy generated by the irreversibilities of the process itself. Okay, that's a better way to say it. Generated by the irreversibilities. Even with just straight heat transfer, if we have some hot object and a cold object, there's going to be heat transfer, or can be if we allow it. And the entropy of the hot side decreases the entropy of the cold side increases but due to irreversible nature of heat transfer across a finite temperature difference this will increase by more then the other one decreased, meaning that for the system as a whole, the two of them together, there will be a total increase in the entropy. And that's what we have here, that the entropy increase will be more than just that uh, that would have been seen for uh, irreversible heat transfer. Alright, so we can put it to, to use a little bit. It'll go something like this. Um, but I remember right near the end of class on Wednesday, we looked at this claim by some inventor. Said that I, he had a 500 degree temperature source supplying heat to an engine. to the tune of a thousand kilojoules. And that would produce work and heat rejected to a low temperature source of 300 K. Right, we did that problem. 
and his claim was there was 410 kilojoules of work produced. We found that claim to be false. We did. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, I was looking at the wrong one. That's not what I was looking at. I was looking at you and I was looking at the nicotine stain on your fingers. <laughs> and and your mustache. And your mustache? <laughs> yeah, they always have they always have a kind of a yellow mustache and nice. beard right. Yeah. Look good. All right, yeah, we did find that to be impossible. Does everybody remember how? Yeah, we looked we looked at the maximum possible efficiency using the temperature limits. and compared that to the uh, real, his claimed thermal efficiency of benefit over work. Sorry, benefit over cost. And we found that his claimed uh, efficiency was greater than was possible from a reversible nature. But we can double check that just in case his lawyers call and protest we can say fine let's sit down and look at it a different way and be kind of smug about it we can also use this new idea we have of looking at the entropy around the cycle well that just comes to be two little bits it's the heat transfer on the high end minus the heat transfer on the low end. Minus just because they're different directions. And so what that's a thousand kilojoules at 500 degrees K. minus the low side heat transfer is what, 590? Just the difference between what comes in and the thousand, what goes out for the work, the rest must be the heat transfer on the low side divided by 300K. And that if you calculate it, I think it comes out to be 0.033 kilojoules per kilogram. But the fact that it's greater than zero indicates that this is uh, uh, a reversible, uh, a system with irreversibilities, and then highlights the impossibility of it which supported the original conclusion. Okay, so to get used to it, we'll work through a couple more problems. Uh, some of these, some of these are a little tricky in how we look at them. Okay, we have we have uh, a heat engine that transfers heat from a, a high temperature source at a thousand Kelvin 
and rejects heat to 300 Kelvin. Yeah. Sorry, a reversible heat engine. A reversible heat engine transfers heat from 1000 K. Okay, so want to find the amount of heat transfer from the source such that the increase, the entropy increase, I can't read my writing, the increase, entropy increase of the source reversible, we know that over the entire cycle, the entropy change will be zero. If it wasn't reversible, this would be, uh, would not be true. What that means for us then is that the change in entropy of the high source will be equal and opposite to the change in entropy of the low source.
producing work this is 200,000 BTUs this is 100,000 BTUs and the temperature of the sink is 600 degrees ranking. So using that you can determine if the uh, heat engine is reversible. Determine if the, this heat engine is reversible. <laughs> Why don't you smoke one of those things Alan smoked? Why don't I? Yeah. Puffs away all through class. I can't even smell it. No. And his fingers aren't all yellow. He's not hacking every morning trying to get out of bed. He doesn't get winded going up the stairs here. Or I guess you take the elevator now.
and that comes out to be what, minus 1.33 or something? Is that right? Or 133? Meaning that the source is losing entropy. If it's reversible, that's the same amount of entropy that the sink will gain. And so that's what you can check with the next part. And since the sink is gaining that temperature, uh, sorry, that heat, then that heat transfer is positive. And it's the entropy change, remember, of the entire system. The uh, uh, source and sink is what matters, and that's 167 here. So, the entire entropy change is uh, plus what? Plus 34. And remember that the deal was that if we look at the entropy for the entire thing, Check that and find delta S for each of the uh, parts of it.
we're gonna have to, we might have to have an intervention here. <laughs> yep. We're only doing this because we love you, Paul. <sighs>
which is uh, meaning using uh, that from the high side. And the temperature at the low side, uh, 273, that's 280. Giving you a heat transfer of what, 283 kilowatts. Now remember, that's still assuming it's reversible. And you can then check that because now we have the, the pieces necessary. So uh, check it as a reversible heat pump. That's when you use the temperature differences. And then you can check that against the thermal heat transfer using the fact that uh, it's benefit over cost. If those agree, then it is reversible. Don't forget, nearly but a round off might not. Uh, make any difference. So if they're very, very close, that's good enough. So what do you think? Is that, is that what the first one came out to be? Okay, well what you could do here is now solve for QL and compare it to this. Well, it's like not even close. Oh, something's wrong with it. Check, check your check your algebra first because it does turn out these are reversible so this should check that becomes uh, Phil you had that that's 17 17 5 or something like that using the temperatures Remember, COP, even though it defines the same as the efficiency, can be greater than 1. And this would be the 300 kilowatts. And the work is the difference between this heat rejection and the heat transfer in, which is, what, 17. And that comes out to be about pretty close to 17.5, a little bit off, doesn't it? Yeah, so that's, that's not enough of a difference to declare this to be irreversible. That does not defeat your assumption here of reversibility. Did you find the trouble, Stephen? Wait, where did that come from? What's this? Oh yeah, that's not right for uh, a heat pump. That's from uh, uh, a heat engine. This is okay. The benefit over the cost is the same for either one. But the, uh, the how the algebra works out on those definitions is a little bit different for each one.
so this is a thermodynamic property that we can now use for real pure substances, which means it's available in the tables. And in fact, not only is it available in the tables, it's available in, in some other ways that can be of some use. Remember that for a reversible heat engine, we define this, or I mean for a reversible process, we define it as that, which means uh, moving things around about so a, a little bit so that the heat transfer is the area under the TDS curve for a reversible process, which brings us to our next diagram if we happen to have some process undergoing a reversible heat transfer. That heat transfer is the area under the process diagram on the, TD, on the TS curve. If it's irreversible, The area under the curve is meaningless. If it's irreversible, we don't actually know where the path is. We just know we go from one point to another, but we don't know exactly how we do that, which means we can't calculate the area. But those TS diagrams can help us a little bit now. What would an irrever uh, sorry, what would a reversible adiabatic process look like on a TS diagram? An isothermal process would go straight across, and so we're going to have entropy change. A reversible adiabatic process would be vertical. Because if it's both reversible and adiabatic, there is no entropy change. And this uh, applies even if we happen to be under the dome in a, a two-phase uh, two process. These processes are known as isentropic, constant entropy processes. And the, uh, the dome could be there or not. Uh, on the TS diagram, the dome has a slightly different shape. Looks more like a, a straight bell curve with lines of constant pressure doing something like that. And we actually have this process, I mean this chart, in the tables. Ken, you're on duty. Not there, or there. Man, I just can't get good help nowadays. Uh, table A9 is a TS diagram for water. And I'll show you just how useful this is now that we have a chart rather than the tables. There, isn't that useful? Look at how much help that would be. Yeah, all you have to do is find your place on there. Might help if you zoom in about six miles. There's just a lot of stuff on there, but it's got uh, quality lines under the dome. The uh, 
specific volume is one of the ones running that way, but so is the pressure running that way, kind of. So you have to be really careful. Uh, used to be that if anybody that worked with uh, steam tables a lot, as I did my first gig at GE, we had huge wall charts of this, and we we're always standing there trying to pick our pick our pick our points off of it, decide where we were. So, in case that's not enough for us in terms of entropy charts, because maybe just finding the ice strain there isn't isn't enough to drive it nuts. We also have HS diagrams, which are known as Molay Molay diagrams. I don't know why this is the only one where a guy gets a special name to it. The dome looks something more like that with lines of constant pressure going something like that and God bless them and put one of those in here too. And there's that. So you might want to memorize that. Oh, you know what? What an awesome tattoo that would be. So, there's the dome. You can just see it in here. Lines of constant pressure going this way. Lines of constant quality. Well, they kind of swoop in and come out here. Uh, you, you want you want the the four by seven foot version of this one as well. All right, we'll stick with the tables. I think they're a little easier to use. Some books used to come with fold out tables in the back or uh, fold out uh, charts in the back, and you. Can Imagine how long those lasted through two semesters. All the way through thermo two as well. Okay, so leave the lights off because we'll uh, go to the tables with these as we work through it. So, imagine in a piston cylinder setup, a closed system, we start with one R134 at a pressure of 240 kilopascals and 20 degrees C undergoes an isothermal process to a quality of 20%. And we need to find the work and the heat transfer. And we'll do it on a per mass basis since we don't have the mass on this one. the heat transfer if we can find the entropy change. Since it's an isothermal process. So as long as we know enough uh, independent intensive properties, we can find those two entropies and then we can find the heat transfer. So we go to the one the R134 tables which are A11 through it looks like A15 so we'll start with uh, start with I might as well start with the pressure table just to see where we are. We don't know whether we're under the dome or not. We know we finish under the dome because we have quality, but we don't know where we start. 
So we'll go to the pressure table A12 as a jumping off place just to see where we are. Because we know if the temperature and pressure both match, then we have, uh, then we are under the dome. So at 240 kilopascals, we see the saturation temperature is minus 5, but our temperature is way over that. We're at 20 degrees. So that tells us we're not at the dome or under the dome. We're in superheat. So we flip over and we see this superheat table has that pressure on it, 0.24 megapascals. Just to check, there's the saturation temperature, but we're way over that. So we go down to 20 degrees at the 0.24 megapascals and our entropy is 10134. Kilojoules per kilogram degree K. find S2, we need, as always, two intensive independent thermodynamic properties. We've got one. We need two. It's isothermal, so we already know the temperature. So we can use that to find the entropy, and then we can find the heat transfer uh, at T2, 20 degrees Celsius. We know we're under the dome because we have a quality of 20%. So we can go back to the temperature table, since that's the thing we have. We don't have pressure to, we only have the temperature to. Oh, how convenient. It's right there in the top row. Life always turns out like that. And there's entropy in the third column there. And that's all we need. SF 30036 plus the 20% quality times SFG. And remember, SFG is just the difference between SG and SF. It's nothing more than that. Just a convenience for us because we always need those values. So in a fit of generosity, they actually calculate them for us. And we get that uh, 0 0.4250, something like that. And then that allows us to find the heat transfer. Also, it allows us to find the uh, direction of the heat transfer. Because all we know is it undergoes this process. We don't know which direction the heat transfer is going in. We might be able to think about it. Um, the temperature was the 20 degrees. But we use Kelvin, and then the delta S now we've got. 4250, what is it, S2, minus S1. So we see right there it's negative, so we know that the system lost heat. And you can calculate that.
then uh, minus 172. Kilojoules per kilogram. So that's the heat transfer. How do we find the work done during this process? Easiest way, I think, is to just use the first law. We know the heat transfer now, and we know that it's a closed system, so that's going to be the change in in, uh, in uh, internal energy. And since we already know the state points, we can get the internal energy values as well. So we'll go back to the superheat table at the very same place we got that that uh, entropy. Wait, that's the pressure table. Superheat table is there. Here's where we got S, and we need U, which is the 246.74. Remember, we know the pressure at point one. We know the temperature at point one, so we can get 246.74. How do we find how do we find U2? If we can find that, then we can find the work. Same way we found S2. It's UF plus X2 UFG. So as you start to do these problems a little bit more, you start to realize, well, if I'm in the tables pulling out the entropy, you can look at the problem and decide I'm going to need enthalpy or internal energy as well. Since it's a closed system, we need an internal energy. If we were doing an open system, we'd want uh, enthalpy. So you can start to just economize a little bit by picking these things out uh, ahead of time. So back to the temperature table, and there's UF and UFG right there at 20 degrees. And so you can figure out then that U2 equals 113. I'm sorry, 111, 3. Using those values right out of the table. And then you can figure out the work. Done. W equals Q minus delta U. So let's see, Q was what? Minus 172. from a, a U2 minus U1, 111.3 minus 246.7. Yeah, we're in SI units. So notice the, the Heat is transferred out, and the change in uh, internal energy is negative, but we subtract that off, so it's actually the, that part contributes. You should get something like minus 37 kilojoules per uh, kilogram. Right? Minus 37? 
What's the minus sign mean? If anything. Work being done on the system. So we know then that this was indeed a compression of the system and uh, we can even draw it on the TS diagram. Remember we started in superheat, finished isothermally somewhere under the dome. So it's a pretty easy diagram to, to draw. Okay, I think you need a get out of class question. Same tables, R134A expanded through a turbine. Producing work of 100 kilowatts. Point one, we know that it's saturated vapor coming in at 1200 kPa. It expands to 100 kilopascals. It's reversible and adiabatic. So I go down the Pink Panther and buy some beautiful pink insulation and uh, know that it's reversible. This clearly is an ACE hardware turbine if it's, er, if it's reversible. Okay, you need to find, well, let's see. We'll shorten a little bit so that somebody can get out early for once. I bet Paul will be motivated. Find, uh, Find the mass flow rate. Find the mass flow rate. Negligible, 
then this just become the work just become m dot h2 minus h1. So you're given the work. If you can find h2 and h1, then you can find out the, the mass flow rate. properties. You've got the pressure. What's the other intensive property that goes with that? Well, just the fact that you're on the dome. What that really is telling you is the uh, quality at point one is one. Yeah. Same thing. Saturated vapor puts you out right on the edge of the dome so you can use the uh, uh, saturated pressure table for that. What are the two intensive properties you know at the second point? Obviously, you know pressure. What's the other point? The other intensive property? It has to be one we either know or we can find from somewhere. So maybe it's given. Like here, those two things were just given. That's easy. Here, only one thing's given. So, what's the second intensive property? Your weekend's ticking away. Now, changing U, remember, is buried in here because uh, U, H is U plus PV. So delta H is delta U plus delta PV. Remember, H was just a, a convenience. What's the second intensive property we know down here or can find? Look at the pink insulation all the way around it. Pink Panther insulation, the very best they make from Ace Hardware. Since it's reversible and adiabatic, it's also isentropic. So the second intensive property is that it's a constant entropy process. So it'll look uh, something like that. And so H2 you can look up right out of the table. H1 is HF plus uh, so you're going to have to find the quality.
Well, Malcolm. Why is the entropy at one influenced by the quality at two? The oh, sorry, that's supposed to be a two there. Ah, okay. Sorry about that. It's kind of like uh, you guys are told not to talk with your mouth full. I, I shouldn't talk while I'm writing. But then class will take twice as long. Except to write, stop, talk, stop, write, stop, talk, stop. This way I'm multitasking. Which, which you guys are into. Got it? Not by knowing too tired? You ready for a weekend? You're ready for a weekend. Well just 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 make up a number and maybe you're right and you can go. What do you guess? No, wrong, you have to stay. Good guess, one of the digits was right. Mm -hmm. Just one? Yeah. Close enough. sure you got the pieces. Let's see. Uh, the uh, enthalpy, entropy comes right out of the table at S, F at that uh, first pressure is 9130. Read the right one, yeah. That leads to a quality of just under 96%. That leads to an enthalpy of 224.9.